So some people might ask, how could plants and bees and food open, open doors for a relationship? <laughs> My name is Tim Heffer. I'm the lead pastor at Hidden Creek Community Church. My wife and I went on a vision trip to Bosnia. The day that we left, some of the workers there said, could you send us a packet of seeds? And then I thought, well, maybe the congregation would want to get involved. And by the time the plane landed, this idea of Seeds of Hope uh, was birthed. Seeds of Hope feeds people produce, but it also just feeds people emotionally, spiritually. It's whatever somebody needs. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we had bees at each of our Seeds of Hope gardens? And so we decided to do a distribution. And over the last year, we've served 5,600 people. As soon as I walked in the doors, it's like, oh, this is home. And I kept coming every week. And then COVID hit. Everything needed to be shut down. One of our volunteers said, well, what if we move everything downstairs? And so we were able to, to serve people well without missing a week. In the morning of August 10th, the house phone went off and the person on the other end said that, that our church was on fire. And there were two apartment complexes that were set on fire. Somebody said, I'm gonna go see the church. I said, the church is on fire? You mean Hidden Creek down there? And so I came running down here. I was able to get around through the neighborhood and pulled into the church. And the place where we distributed food had been burned out. We don't know what caused uh, the arsonist to step into this senseless act. It's hard to look at the loss, the generations of, of resources. That was Monday morning and, and food distribution was coming on Wednesday. I thought there is no way we can get food out to people this Wednesday. But Jesus had so engaged the hearts of our volunteers that they couldn't imagine going a week without serving their community. Several people realized that we could do a pop-up distribution in our front lot. And the Thurston County Food Bank said, what if we brought food to you each week? And by the time the food had been assembled, I knew that Jesus again was doing a new thing at Hidden Creek. Not a day was missed. Even on the pouring down sideways rain, they were out here serving lines of people <laughs> with love and a sense of humor. I was so proud of my church. Fire on Monday and we're still serving on Wednesday. My heart swelled three sizes bigger. I was surprised that they went ahead and opened up two days later and it was a miracle. These people here are, are wonderful. It's meant a lot to us, uh, to me, my neighbors. We come up here every week. Having the fire here, you know, and them still doing this, it's a lifesaver, uh, honestly. Sometimes you just think, I can't do this anymore. But then you've got a tote full of food that's gonna go to the food bank. You can't match that feeling any other way, I don't think. It's like, this is why we went through the drudgery, because now we get to pay it back. Everything that we do, from Seeds of Hope to our food distribution to the bees, is all about relationship. There is this receptivity to Jesus when we meet people at their point of need. I don't even know how it comes from such a small church. The heartbeat is to serve those who can't serve themselves, paying attention to people that the world would like to ignore, and, and to love those who don't know love. shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings yeah this is amazing
Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. morning church I'm going to be reading from Psalm 34 verses 1 through 3 I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul shall make its boast in the Lord the humble shall hear of it and be glad oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name forever Jesus, as, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would change us and make us more like yourself. I ask this in your mighty name. Amen. Does life ever make you dizzy? The past 10 months has for me. It's hard to keep up with, with all the health phases, isn't it? What we can do, what we can't do. Uh, there are so many new patterns of life that, that we have to adjust to. Friendships are different. Shopping is different. Expectations are different. And wow, political stuff has, has shaken everyone across the spectrum. We live in dizzying times. Abram, in scripture, experienced a whirlwind of changes that led him across the Middle East from modern day Iraq and Turkey uh, into Syria and southern Lebanon, and into Israel, Palestine, and eventually Egypt. He was constantly on the move, stepping into new cultures and places, responding to God and, and navigating change. Eventually, he had to get used to a new name, and he had to get used to becoming a parent at a really old age. As we look at the next segment of his life today, we'll see that in the dizziness of life, there are times when we're to stop and listen. There are times when we're to stop and speak. And there are times when we're to continue on in our journey. 
let's look again at, at Genesis chapter 12, the, the first five verses, to set the context uh, for our passage, our, our account today. Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and you will be blessed. I am going to bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And in verse 4, So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, who would be renamed Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Verse 6, Abram, this is our account for today, Abram and his caravan of people traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now let's stop there. There are times when we have to, like Abram, stop and listen. And it was at this place, Shechem, that he stopped. Shechem means the saddle or shoulder, a low spot between hills. If we were to look to the west from Shechem, uh, which is modern-day Nablus, we would see two large hills. On the northern side would be Mount Ebal, and on the southern side, Mount Gerizim. Now, these hills, by Pacific Northwest standards, were mountains by ancient Israeli standards. And it was on these hills during the time of Joshua where the law of God was read. We find that in Joshua 8, 33. Now, Shechem is a significant spot, too, because later uh, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, would establish a well there. And the well exists to this day. Now, 2,000 years ago, Jesus met a woman beside this well, and a conversation that he had with her changed her life. He told her that he was the living water, the one who satisfies the soul, and she believed him. Now, this place, Shechem, is a significant place in our heritage of faith. Here, in this low spot of blessing, in this saddle, the Lord said to Abram, I will bless you. I'm going to give you this land. And Abram responded by worshiping. He set up an altar there to mark the spot where he had encountered God, and he worshiped. Now, from this place, in the saddle between this place of blessing, Abram stopped, and he listened, and he heard the voice of God. From here, Abram could see the fertile grasslands of the north. To the west, he could see high hills that would then drop down into the Mediterranean Sea. And to the west, he would see hills that today are, are speckled with olive trees. In this place, God said, I am going to give you this land to you and your offspring. And Abram built an altar there. Where? Where are the places God has spoken to you? How did you respond? There are times when we have to stop so we can hear the voice of God, so that we can hear his message to us. Now, look at verse 8 of, of chapter 12. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tents there. From, from Bethel uh, on the west and Ai on the east, there he, he, he went and he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Now, there are times when we also have to stop and talk. Abraham built an altar to the Lord in this place, and he called on the name of the Lord. From Shechem, Abram traveled about 20 miles to the south, 
to a place between Bethel and Ai. This is a significant spot as well. Bethel means the house of God. This is where Abram set up his tent and, and built an altar to the Lord, to the Lord and, and called on the name of the Lord. He stopped and he talked to God. Here in this place where he built this place of remembrance, uh, he worshiped. He dedicated this place to the place where he talked to the Lord. Later, his grandson Jacob would sleep one night under the, the stars of Bethel using a stone for a pillow, and he would have a vision of a ladder reaching to the heavens. On the ladder, he envisioned angels ascending and descending, and he said, this truly is Bethel, the house of the Lord. There he heard the Lord speak his promise to him, the one that he had spoken to Abraham, saying to Jacob that his descendants would be blessed and that the people of earth would be blessed through him. In John 1, 51, Jesus references this event by telling a man named Nathaniel that he himself was the ladder uh, between earth and heaven upon which the angels ascended and descended, that Jesus was this, this one. Bethel is a great place in our faith heritage as well. From this place, Abram could see Judea and, and Jerusalem, and he could see how the land dropped and disappeared into the lush Jordan Valley, and how the Jordan emptied to the south in the sea, the Dead Sea. Now far to the east, he could see the hills of Moab, and beyond those hills, he couldn't see, but he knew that it was there some 400 miles away, his former homeland. But in this place, he now called home, for the Lord had given it to him. Here in this place, as Abram spoke, God was silent. We don't know how long Abram lingered there. He stopped, built an altar to worship. He called on the Lord, but God was silent. Have you ever had seasons like that in your life? You're in the right place. You're doing the right things. You're doing your best to follow, but God, God is silent. When Job experienced that, when Job complained about God being silent, his friend Elihu reminded him that God is greater than any mortal. Why do you complain to him, he asked, that he responds to no one's words? For God does speak, now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. Job 33, uh, 12 to 14. Job's friend concluded that though we don't perceive it, God does speak. But if he does remain silent, as far as we know, well, that's okay, because he's God. David felt this way about God's silence. Psalm 22, verses 2 and 3 says, My God, I cry out to you, but you do not answer. By night I cry out, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. At Bethel, Abram called to God, and yet God was silent. And Abram, it seems, was okay with that. Where are the places that you've called upon God? How did he respond? Could you hear him? Did you sense his presence? Or was he silent? Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Abram continued on his journey. He stopped and he listened. He stopped and spoke and he continued on his journey. Verse 9 of Genesis chapter 12 says, Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Abraham went from a well-watered land, fertile hills, to the desert of the south. This, this, this call led him south into the desert, this place simply called in Scripture the Negev. Now there are, are times when we're led into desert places. Today, this area of the Negev is, 
it's uh, it's it too is a desert land now and it receives less than an eighth of an inch of, of rain each year it's a place where I've spent a little bit of time over the years with Meg and the teams uh, as we've traveled to the Middle East it's a place of hot winds and dust camels and donkeys Sahara sands and, and grit rise on the winds from Africa and settle all over this region Today, Bedouin villages dot the desert landscape. We've been to some of them. And nomads, they, like Abram, wander from place to place, some living in tents, most today living in corrugated metal-roofed shanties. But their approach to life and their tribal ways of living, shepherding, goat herding, trading in camels and olive oil, are similar to the nomadic life of Abram. In this barren place, Abram experienced a famine. On top of the desert, he experienced a famine, a great famine. And this caused him to go with his caravan to the Nile Delta and into Egypt. There, he would make some mistakes. He would discover God's grace. And he would experience God's provision. This is one of the more awkward times of Abram's life. I wish that there was a verse in scripture that says, even in our goofiness, God accomplishes his best and his will for us. There are two places in scripture that come close. Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And the second is, is this group of verses, Genesis 12, 10 to 20. Uh, these are really awkward verses for Abram and Sarai. Out of fear for his life, he, con he conceived this idea uh, and convinced his wife to pretend that she was his sister so that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would not kill him and would spare her and everything that he had. Now, this was really an awkward time for Sarai too, don't you think? Uh, Pharaoh took her into his harem as, as one of his own wives for a period of time. And she lived there in his palace. These two, Abram and Sarai, two that, that God would use as ancestors of Jesus, they were in a tough spot. They were threatened by famine. They were threatened by insecurities. Their family was fragmented. And in their golden years, they lived out this situation, this awkward time, as they waited for God to fulfill his promises to them. In Genesis 12, 16, Scripture says, Pharaoh treated Abram well for Sarah's sake, and Abram acquired sheep and camels, cattle, donkeys, and servants while all this was taking place. Now, do you know how God got them out of this awkward situation, this weird, awkward situation? He sent a sickness to Pharaoh's house, his entire household, and when Pharaoh discovered the truth that Abram was married to Sarai, he deported them from Egypt. And he said, oh, on your way out, take everything that you've acquired while you, are, while you were here. And they were sent away. Abram and Sarai went into Egypt to escape the famine. And they were sent back home with livestock to satisfy their hunger. And their caravan grew. God takes our mistakes and he offers us grace. And he provides for us in ways that only he could. Can you identify awkward desert places in your life? Places where the hot winds blow and where life's dust and grit stings your eyes? Places where famine threatens your peace? How do you see? Or how are you seeing God provide for you? How are you seeing him meet you in the awkward struggles of life? How have you seen God rescue you, restore you, and replenish you? He does that, you know. Some of you have seen this over the years. Some of you are still waiting, and some of you are, are still wondering about that. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Genesis 13, 1-4 says, So Abram went up from Egypt 
to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram had become very wealthy, Scripture says, in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, the place between Bethel and Ai, where he had, he had camped out earlier, the place where he had built his altar. And there Abram again called on the name of the Lord. Abram was oriented through faith and the experiences of life. He wandered from place to fa place by faith, not knowing where he was headed. But by faith, he knew that he would make his home and the land promised to him. Abram discovered that God speaks. God spoke to him and he speaks to us through scripture by his Holy Spirit. And Abram discovered that God receives worship and that he could talk to God and call on him. Olympia, Tumwater, Lacey, Rochester, Tenino, Grand Mound, Thurston County, this place we live, this place that we've been called to serve, these are the places where we hear from God, where we talk to God and are led by him. The God who met and blessed Abram, who protected Sarai, watches over us. He watched over them in Shechem and Bethel and the Negev and Egypt. And this is the God who meets us today in our places, in the places where we live. He meets us through his son Jesus, and he lives in us by his Holy Spirit. Abram was called to leave the places and faces and practices and family members that were familiar so that he would experience time after time after time things that would deepen his faith and give him opportunities to trust and to follow the Lord his God. Our faith is about trust in God through Christ. More than the blessings that we experience, our faith is about following God fully and experiencing him in the day-to-day -day ways and the places that he leads so that our, our faith too can go deep. my voice and pour it out let it sing the songs of mercy I have found for I have nothing I am nothing without you and all my soul Take my body and build it up. May it be broken as an offering of love. For I have nothing, I have nothing without you. And all my
But I love you God speaks to us. He listens to us. He leads us on this journey of faith in Christ. So friends, may grace and peace be yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.